service. Um, it's a common service that draws people in who maybe haven't been in church in a while, or maybe haven't given any thought to coming to church in a while. It's important to remember that Jesus' resurrection, the resurrection of Christ was the means by which we receive all the things that God promises to us. And so that's what we're celebrating today. That's what we're remembering as we go through this service. So we'll begin on page four with the service. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Let us draw near to him in worship and praise, in humble sincerity and bold confidence. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Dear friends, if not for this day, our guilt before God for wicked thoughts, hurtful words, and selfish acts would remain. Christ's death on the cross would be meaningless and our standing before God hopeless. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're, you're still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. His resurrection on Easter Sunday is the Father's declaration that the payment made for sin on Good Friday was sufficient. Because of this day, you stand forgiven before God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If not for this day, death would remain an unstoppable foe. Not only would it separate us all from all for which we labor in this life, it would sever us from God and those we love, never to be reunited. If Christ has not been raised, those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Just as death came through Adam, so also the resurrection of the dead comes through Christ. Because of this day, you too will rise from the grave. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If not for this day, our faith and religion would be pointless. All worship and prayer, self-denial and struggle against sin would only make for a miserable existence in this life and get us nowhere in the life to come. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. By rising on the third day, just as he said, Jesus proved every claim about himself true and every promise to us trustworthy. Because of this day, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah. 
Let us pray. O God, you made the dawn of this most holy day shine with the glory of our Lord's resurrection. Grant that we who have been raised from the death of sin by your life-giving spirit may worship you in sincerity and truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for this morning comes from the book of Job, chapter 19. The glory of the gospel is not found in the health, wealth, and prosperity of those who believe in it, but rather the glory of the gospel is found in the truth that from the deepest depths of loss, Christians can say along with Job that there's more to this life, that we know that there is more to this life because we know that our Redeemer lives. We read, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God.
for the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. Please stand. Our gospel for this morning comes from the book of Mark. It's the resurrection account. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The word of God to which we turn our attention this morning is written in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 15. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I think it all started with the so-called nine-dot puzzle. Do you remember this? The goal of the puzzle was try to, to try to connect all nine dots using no more than four continuous straight lines, and you were not allowed to lift the tip of your pen or pencil from the surface of the paper as you made those four lines. The solution to the puzzle that wasn't immediately obvious is that you actually needed to extend those lines beyond the apparent boundaries established by those nine dots. In other words, in order to solve the puzzle, you needed to think outside the box. And so an expression was born. For quite some time, thinking outside the box was sort of the, the trendy thing to say in the world of business management and consulting. After a while, it became a tired cliche that just about everyone had grown sick of. Well, don't worry. As a result of some very recent events in our world, I have an idea for an expression that can take its place. When the solution to a problem isn't immediately obvious, when it requires creativity and unconventional thinking, instead of calling that thinking outside the box, we can now call it thinking outside the banks. <laughs> Perhaps you caught wind of this six-day-long saga where a ship by the name of the Ever Given got stuck between the banks of the Suez Canal. It was quite a remarkable story. The ship in question weighed 224,000 tons. It was nearly as long as the Empire State Building is high. And for every day that it was stuck there in the canal, it cost global shipping chains approximately $15 billion every single day. In fact, experts suggested that if it had been stuck for just one more day, then it was entirely likely that very soon, once again, in our local grocery stores, we would find absolutely no toilet paper, as was the case at this time last year. Only this time around, not only would there not be any toilet paper, there would not be any coffee either. So toilet paper plus coffee, I think you can agree this was a pretty serious problem. But it was interesting, as the saga unfolded, to see how this story and the images that went along with it and the memes that resulted sort of gradually transformed into a metaphor for life. Slowly but surely, people started to kind of relate to what was going on there. It, it resonated with them, and for pretty good reason when you think about it. It's very easy for us to feel as though most of the time we're kind of cruising along through life, and sure, there are waves on the water every now and then, but the types of things that, that stress us out and cause us to worry are things like whether we're going to make a deadline at work or what type of college the kids are going to get into. But then at some point, we come along some sort of gigantic and immovable barrier, a barrier that grinds everything in life to a screeching halt and makes everything else seem small by comparison. And of course, out of all the gigantic and immovable barriers that lie downstream for us as human beings, death is the very biggest and the very most immovable. So for example, 
perhaps all of a sudden that health that we so easily take for granted is actually in jeopardy because the doctor tells us that we need to start chemo treatments right away on Monday. Or perhaps that person that we love so dearly and in fact depend on suddenly kicking and, and screaming against our will and through all kinds of tears we have to say goodbye to them. One way or another, all of our routes in life eventually come across death, that large, scary, immovable object. And so what then? What happens when all the normal and conventional ways that we use to deal with our problems fail? What happens when all of the effort and determination and discipline and hustle in the world isn't going to move death, not even a single inch? Easter is the perfect day for us to be asking questions such as these. Other problems in life that may have a smaller scope and a smaller scale, those can be dealt with in other ways and on other days. But the biggest questions that we have in life, including this question about death, can only be answered outside Jesus' empty tomb. And so as we look at these verses from 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, we are going to see that our death-sized problem requires a resurrection-sized solution. Paul wrote these words to a group of Christians who, it seems, were having a difficult time connecting the dots, you might say. They firmly believed the very thing that we are gathered here to celebrate today. They believed that Jesus had risen from the dead, but they failed to see how what had happened to Jesus had anything to do with what was going to happen to them, specifically when they died. Instead, they were holding on to the best alternative solution to death that the world around them could possibly offer. The idea goes something like this. When a person dies, it seems rather obvious that that is the end of the physical part of them. We put a body into the ground and it generally tends to stay put. But maybe that's not true for the other part of us. Our mind, our, our spirit, our soul, whatever it is that you want to call it. Who knows, maybe even after our physical life comes to an end, maybe that invisible part of us continues to exist. In other words, if death is the 224,000 ton tanker that is blocking the canal ahead of us, then maybe, just maybe, our souls are slippery enough to kind of sneak by. That's an idea that's been around in our world for a long, long time, and it's actually still around in our world and very prevalent today. You hear it expressed in commonly and widely accepted ideas such as this. The idea that your true self, your authentic self, is your inner self. And along with it, the idea that your physical body is, at best, just sort of an incidental part of who you are, or at the very worst, a prison that your true and authentic self may well be trapped in. In fact, did you know that the best and brightest minds in the world who are working on solving the problem of death right now, the very best idea that they have, their, their best hope for how we might defeat death goes like this, that at some point through technology, we might be able to sort of upload our entire mind and our entire consciousness into the cloud and then even after this physical shell is no longer working, we would still be able to live on in some other form of physical shell. Now, if that's the best solution that human beings can possibly come up with for death, that is naturally going to show itself in the way that we live, in very problematic ways. Paul identifies some of those problematic ways in this letter. One of the ones that he mentions is sexual immorality. If my body really is just an incidental part of who I am, then why can't I use it however I want? Why can't I use it to gratify whatever desire that I might have? Why can't I use it as an instrument, sort of the way that I would use my vehicle? It's just a thing that gets me where I want to go, a thing that helps me pursue my desires. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul also talks about how in the church they had elevated and emphasized knowledge for themselves at the expense of love for their fellow human beings. 
if my mind is really the one part about me that is going to endure after death, why not give it all of my attention? And if my body is just going to go in the ground and be done with, then why would I possibly give any thought or attention to the food or the clothing or the aid that my neighbor's body might need? In fact, it's been interesting over the course of the past year to kind of watch a specific way in which this idea has manifested itself. This thing that we've all been doing for the past year, really not by choice but by necessity, including here at church. But the idea that maybe it is really no different if each and every Sunday I sit down on my couch wearing my pajamas, sipping my coffee, and I just sort of download the weekly spiritual content that I need. And who really cares if I never have to come into any sort of real contact with another real human being ever again? Not just while a pandemic is going on, but maybe, maybe that's the new thing. Maybe that's the way of the future. If the world's solution to death is really the best that we can possibly offer, then all of that makes perfect sense. And that's exactly why Paul gives his assessment, the assessment that he gives in these verses. He says, if death really is the end, even if just of our physical existence, then the last thing in the world that anyone would ever want to be is a Christian. Why? Because Christianity tells us to control our bodies, tells us to use our bodies to bring glory to God rather than to help us pursue our desires. Christianity also tells us to love and serve our neighbor, including in his bodily and physical needs. Christianity tells us to do a million other things that make absolutely no sense if our physical existence comes to an end at death. In fact, a million other things that make our physical existence more difficult and more painful for as long as it might last. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, Paul says, we are to be pitied more than all people. If death really is the end, even of just our bodies, then why not eat, drink, and be merry for as long as we have? If death is the end, it would be pitiful to live as if it weren't. Now, when I hear that word pitiful, I can't help but think of one of the images that made its way around the internet this past week and eventually was the subject of a lot of different memes. When the size of an effort is nowhere near the size of the problem, when all of the effort and all of the time involved in the world isn't possibly going to make one bit of difference, pitiful seems to be a, an appropriate word to use. Now, to be fair, the excavator in that picture kind of got a bad rap this week as this picture made its way around the internet. Eventually, that ex excavator, of course, was a part of the solution in getting this gigantic ship unstuck, along with dozens of other excavators and dozens of tugboats pulling in the water. Eventually, the Ever Given was set free and it sailed on its way. But do you know the one thing that really made the difference, the one thing that put the effort over the top? It wasn't a, a solution or an idea or an effort that was outside the box or even outside the banks. It was a solution that was truly outside this entire world. In the end, it was the moon that made the difference. You see, last Sunday, a week ago today, there was a full moon and in particular, a full moon where the moon was especially close to the Earth in its orbit. And as a result from the gravitational pull of the moon, the tide in the Suez Canal rose about 18 inches above its normal high tide level, helping set the boat free. And the best part was, because the lunar cycles are so predictable, all of the engineers and scientists that were working on the problem knew that this heavenly help was on the way, that it was going to come. It was predictable. It was inevitable. And so yes, even the very best solutions that our world can possibly offer for death are pitiful. But the solution that God has sent down from heaven is inevitable. And that's what Paul wants to stress 
in these verses. As I mentioned before, these Corinthians already believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. And in fact, just for good measure, Paul had, had sort of recounted the historical evidence and all of the eyewitness testimony that was available to substantiate that fact earlier in the chapter. But here his stress is on the relationship between Christ's resurrection and our own. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, Paul wants us to know, our own resurrection is inevitable. Paul calls Christ the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So for a farmer, the first fruits are that part of the crop that is ready to be, ready to be harvested first. So just Im imagine a farmer who has a field and he plants that entire field with all the same seed. And he waters that entire field equally with all the same water. And the sun shines on that field with all the same rays. And so then finally harvest time rolls around. And yes, there's, there's one corner of the field that is ready to be harvested just a little bit sooner than the rest. But if one part of that field does in fact produce a harvest, is there any doubt whatsoever that the rest of the field will as well? Of course not. Once those first fruits have come in, the rest of the harvest is predictable. The rest of the harvest is inevitable. Paul makes the same point by comparing Christ to Adam. He says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So how inevitable is our resurrection from the dead? It is as inevitable as death itself is. It is as inevitable as the tide rising when there's a full moon. Not only have those two dots been connected to one another, Christ's resurrection and our own, but those two dots cannot possibly be disconnected anymore. Because Christ has risen, so also we shall rise. That is the future that is in store for us. If death is that 224,000 ton ship that is standing in our way, our last and best hope is not simply that our souls might somehow sneak around it. No, instead the walls of that immovable barrier of death have already been torn down. Because Christ is risen, we too shall rise. Death is not the end. Not for our souls, not for our bodies either. Which means that it sure would be a pity if we lived as though it were. Paul wraps up these verses by saying that once we rise from the dead, then the end will come. More literally, he says, then we will have reached our goal. We will be at that place that is the entire point and the entire purpose of the life that God gave us in the first place which means that our resurrection from the dead is not just something that's going to happen to us at some day in the future. It means that our resurrection from the dead makes all the difference in our lives right here, right now, today. I mean, think about it. If you set a goal for yourself, a 10-year goal, that 10 years from now, you are going to have this or that degree, that you are going to have this or that job, that you are going to be married, that you are going to have this number of kids. You know full well that you don't just wake up 10 years from now and find yourself having arrived at that goal. If you make that goal for yourself, it changes every single day that comes before it. Once you make that goal, it puts you on a completely different path. And the same is true for our resurrection from the dead. All those things that, that Christianity tells us to do, that it tells us to control our bodies and use them to glorify God, that it tells us to love and serve our neighbor, including in their physical and bodily needs, all of those things are done, including those millions of other things that seem to make our physical existence more difficult and challenging, all of them are done in service to our goal. When we do those things, we are investing in the very stuff that eternity is made out of. When we do those things, we are buying up the currency that runs the economy in heaven. And so again, it sure would be a pity if we lived in some other way. If with our lives we pursued what was immediate instead of what was inevitable. 
if we took those walls of the grave that have been torn down by Jesus and we put them back up and hopped back into the box ourselves, if death isn't the end of our existence, it sure would be pitiful to live as though it were. And of course, that if isn't really an if at all. While our resurrection remains invisible to us as we sit here today, that's why it's so important that it's inevitable. That's why it's so important that those dots have been connected between our future resurrection and Christ's past resurrection. It's why it's so important that that connection cannot be broken. In fact, it is so predictable and so inevitable that that very thing we are gathered here to celebrate today, to answer all of life's most important questions outside of Jesus' grave, to realize that our death-sized problem has a resurrection-sized solution, we are gathered here to celebrate it today, believe it or not, because of the moon. Each and every year, Easter falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon of spring, that very same full moon that raised the tide and moved aside that immovable object. It's like clockwork. It's predictable. It's inevitable. We can count on it. We don't say to ourselves, well, if Jesus has risen from the dead, no, instead we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And indeed, not if, but indeed, so will we. Amen. Please stand. Join with me as we confess our common Christian faith, including our faith in the resurrection of the body, as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We pray. Almighty God, Lord God, on this glorious day, fill your people with certain hope at the resurrection of your Son, that we would tremble no longer before the grave, but rejoice and live in the truth of your power to save. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Bless us with faith that holds fast to the word preached to us, that receiving it with joy we may take our stand in it and be saved by it. Hinder all who would sow doubt into our hearts and grant us courage to confess its truth in our life and conversation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy on the sick and those in any need. Let the dawning light of the new creation in Christ sustain them in faith. In accord with your will, grant them renewed health, a foretaste of their eternal healing in him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort those who mourn with the truth of Christ's empty tomb, that in the midst of their grief they may abide in the hope of his resurrection. Uphold them in faith as they await the day when you will wipe every tear from all faces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We join today in singing eternal alleluias with innumerable angels around your throne and with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. We bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us here this morning for this Easter service. If you'd like to take the next few moments to let us know you were here, you can do so by going to www.goodnewslc.org connect. And if you'd like to support our ministry with an offering, you can do so at goodnewslc.org give. Thank you.
please stand for prayer. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. Grant that we who have been raised with him through faith may walk in newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may our glorious Father, who by his power raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, give you the spirit of wisdom to know the hope to which you have been called. And may he preserve you in body and soul until the day of your own resurrection on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Once again, good morning and welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here on this most joyful of days. We invite everyone to stick around for the Easter breakfast that we have planned for today. Just a couple of notes about that breakfast. Right now, all of the food uh, is in the back in the kitchen area, but right as the service is wrapping up here and shortly after, we're actually going to make two serving stations. So one of them will be over by the kitchen. The other one, we're going to set up a couple of tables over right where that uh, back row of chairs is in our worship space. So if you just want to hang out for a little bit, uh, it shouldn't take very long at all. And then once they're set up, you can use either serving line. So they're, they're going to be exactly the same. You'll be able to find some of every last thing that you want to eat today at either one. And then, as you probably noticed as you walked in, it is a gorgeous day out there today, and we've got tables and chairs set up outside along with a tent if you're interested in a little bit of shade. So once you've grabbed your food and your beverage, we invite you to to head outside and either stand or sit as you desire. Finally, one other note, we are uh, taking a free will offering today uh, in connection with our Easter breakfast, and that free will offering is going to support our foster care support group here at Good News. So through uh, sort of a national agency, we get hooked up with local foster families and provide them with aid or support in whatever way they might need. And so we're taking a free will offering just to help that group in their efforts. Um, So there's both the regular offering box and then a separate one for that free will offering right on the ledge near the window as you make your way outside today. Thank you so much again for being here today. I wish you God's richest blessings today as you celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.